Welcome to the Epigenetics Podcast from Active Motif. Join host Dr. Stefan Dillinger for lively discussions with leading epigenetics researchers. Hear about their past experiments, what they're working on now, and what's coming next. You know their papers, now get to know them and discover the stories behind the science. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Epigenetics Podcast. Today I'm happy to welcome Jonathan Wettstein from Fox Chase Cancer Center on this show. Please let me briefly introduce you to our audience. You got your PhD from Wayne State University in Detroit in 2002. You then moved on to do a postdoc at Harvard Medical School with Yang Shi from 2002 to 2007. After that, you joined the Fox Chase Cancer Center and you are still there today. A question I like to ask every guest to start off our little podcast is, how did you become interested in biology in the first place and then in pursuing a career in science? Yeah, so... Um, my introduction to science or my passion for working in research really came from when I was in high school. I had a high school biology teacher named Will Stewart, who had been at St. Jude's for about 13 years, who was like working on biochemical purifications of glycoprotein. His uh, mentor had gotten cancer and passed and he had to make a choice. What is he going to do? And he decided to teach high school. And I was fortunate many years later to have his class and he drew the Punnett square on the board. And then that changed my life forever. It was that moment. Um, I can recall it like yesterday and he cared about me. My mother was raising my brother and I, and he just stepped in to make sure that he was a positive influence as far as science and as a mentor and uh, provided guidance. Um, it was stern, you know, because he had to help keep me on the right path. But he really opened the door in my eyes to everything. And in fact, so much so that uh, when I got my PhD, I dedicated it to him, my wife, and my mother. And then when I ultimately became a faculty at Harvard Medical School, Mass General Hospital, initially, um, he actually came there to kind of help me walk in and be there for when I opened my office. Um, he's also godfather of my daughter. Um, so he really made a huge impact on my life. And it was through that interaction and um, kind of lifelong commitment. It's also what showed me about mentorship and how important it is and uh, how people can really do one small thing and make a big difference in your life. Yeah, it really seems so. And I mean, the teachers have an impact on your life very early on, right? So um, that's also a fact that maybe then has even more impact when it's early in life. Yeah, it was kind of funny because recently I gave a lecture at St. Jude's and I had talked to St. Jude's about him and his health is, you know, he's he's in 80. And so it was, but they arranged for him to be there in the audience front row for me to thank him. Um, and it was really cool because he had worked there. So it was like a full circle moment and uh, they gave a big applause. And, you know, it was just one of those really um, important things. I think often a scientist uh, we get hung up in the discovery, the grants, the papers, the needing to make sure that we keep everything moving. And I think what's really important, and I think this is important for trainees, um, as well as mentors themselves, but trainees in particular, is to remember that who comes through your life and don't forget to let them know, because you may not think an email to say, hey, guess what? This is what's happened to me will matter to somebody, but it matters often even more than a paper in many ways, because uh, it's a person. And I think that's something that um, has been very, very important to me over the years. So let's hope that this conversation also has an impact at the, uh, to at least one person. <laughs> yeah, I hope. You know, you, all you need to do is change one life. I mean, that's. I think that's the, that's the other thing too about science, right? Is, And I think that's what I love about it is as you train people and you encounter them, um, if you just open one little avenue, show them what they like or show them what they don't like. We often focus on, we want people to like what we do, but even if they realize that it's not what they want and they go off into another area or they go into a different science or a different type or a different question, or even look for different mentorship because they know what's better for them. It's a lifelong learning process. And it's a process of kind of helping the next group figure out the best way. And uh, ultimately that's how discovery is made. And if say you can't cure cancer like my ultimate goal was when I was in high school as an individual, maybe through your collective exposures, interactions, and collaborations, you can. Yeah. So let's talk about your science that centers around how chromatin factors influence gene expression and genome stability with a focus on the role of Jumanji C containing histone demethylases and their impact on drug-resistant oncogenes. 
Um, I want to start in the year 2010. I guess this was the first paper out of your own lab. Um, there you identified a conserved and unappreciated role for the Jumanji 2A KDM4A uh, histone tree demethylase in cell cycle progression. Um, can you talk how you got into that and what you found uh, there? Yeah, so actually it's it's a very important paper for the lab and for me because it really opened the door to where we are and what we're even doing today and the mass exploration that's happened and even has really impacted those initial uh, postdocs that were in the lab working on it because now their labs are kind of built on various aspects of this. So um, what I, when I finished my post, I had discovered demethylases when I was in Yangshi's lab. So this year will be 20 years of celebrating demethylases at the end of the year. So that's, and, that's a very good time to do this interview, right? Then, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, and, and so after that discovery, um, being in, his, in Yang's lab, I had found this family of proteins, which were like an enigma. They were unique because they regulated lysine 9 and 36 methylation. And at the time, um, starting a lab, I had to make a choice about which factors, where would I put my energy and we had also discovered the lysine 4 and lysine 27 demethylases. Of course, that was touching bivalency potentially or stem cells. And of course, the world was converging at a rapid rate. So strategically, I made a decision to focus on those initial tridemethylases I found out of the whole collection and really bring my lab to focus in on that area. And we had C. elegans as a model. So my lab used C. elegans at the time a lot. And it really that those experiments, and there was a uh, she's now a, the leader of the Ann Schultz in Ann Schultz in the Movement to Swords Clinic, Emily Forbes. She was a my first technician. She um, did some initial C. elegant experiments and had found there was this instability in the germline that was validating what we had published and cell before that when I was a postdoc. But then she, we started looking carefully, and we found that it looked like there were replication kind of abnormalities in the germline. And then Josh Black, uh, who's a faculty at the Ann Schultz Medical Center as well, he's associate professor there. He joined my lab and he was, I was curious about what the human counterparts did because we were not finding, or I didn't find even in my own hands, roles in like major transcriptional control. And so we used the genetic model to kind of tell us what happened. And that's what led us to a screen we did where we identified that the replication kinase ATR was involved. And we weren't damaging the worms. We weren't doing anything overt to them. So this was a natural biology of which the ATR kinase was sensing, which is typically replicative stress and things like this. So we dug deeper into that and found that that was true in the worm model. And then through Josh's work and then Capucine Van Rijkum, who's now a faculty at Stanford, assistant professor in pathology, she joined the team. And between the three of them initially, we kind of broke ground on this idea that this demethylase was having an instrumental role in controlling replication and um, potentially influencing when the timing of replication was happening and it was affecting the, you know, the S phase progression. And so then that really, we found that there was consistency between the two organisms warm to human. And then another really important piece came out of it, which is one of the, I think an earlier documentation of this is that there was a direct kind of pairing between it heterochromatin binding protein, HP1 gamma, and the demethylase. They were kind of working um, antagonistically to each other. And then we subsequently wanted to show that um, this was in the timing and control of the demethylase through post-translational control was critical, not transcription, but its own PDM control. And this influenced S phase. It was that those studies that then gave rise to all the work that's ongoing currently and the future of the lab in the context of the role of epigenetic regulators or chromatin regulators in controlling replication, as well as this was the early steps to us and then discovering how epigenetic mechanisms control extra chromosomal amplifications, which our lab was the first to document. Mm. So you then overexpressed KDM4A and Chumanji uh, D2A. Um, what did this do to the protein and what did you find doing so? Yeah, so um, context. So it became important to, you know, we started with overexpression. For, we had knockout worms, knockout worm models. Um, we could deplete it in cells, no problem. We did overexpression for a reason is obvious now is that about 19% of tumors carry an amplification of KDM4A. So, and in certain cancers like ovarian, we found as much as 46% of the cases. 
So the increased expression became curious, what would that do to a cell? Why would a cell do that? And so we overexpressed it. And when you overexpress, what we found in that initial study was that it helped um, move through S phase more effectively. But what was interesting about that is this net proliferation time was the same. So that meant that somewhere along that advancement through S, there was something checkpointing or some problem, something the cell observed that slowed it down. So its cell growth was not net beneficial. And that observation is what led us to start asking questions about why. And through a series of a lot of experiments, that's how we found the link to the focal transient site-specific amplifications that we discovered. Mm -hmm. So you just mentioned that there are extra chromosomal um, functions of uh, this protein. Um, and this is what you revealed next, right? A non-chromatin-linked role for KDM4A. Um, so this was all maybe in the early days of getting a hold of the function of KDM4A and characterizing this protein even more. So what did you find there? Yeah, so we kind of took a multifaceted approach to studying the enzyme because I was fascinated by what does the enzyme do because of its link to cancer and because the demethylases um, could be targeted because they can respond to, you know, things like, you know, cofactors and things because of their, you know, requirements. We started asking, like, what do they do? And um, we use biochemical purifications to kind of tell us things about who does it interact with, which compartments. So there was two, two or three things that emerged from those studies is that when we did the purifications, consistent with the role in replication, we found that it purified a lot of replication machinery. In fact, mm -hmm. most of the replosome. So it didn't have an orc, but it had a lot of the other components. At the same time, when we purified it, we also found that it purified a lot of translation factors and translation proteins. And that was kind of mysterious to us. Um, so we had these two different types of groups, as well as roles for splicing and processing, uh, which we went on to characterize as well later. But we had these different complexes, which told us that it may have these different roles in, 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 um, in the cell. And so uh, what how this kind of went forward is when we identified the role and links to replication factors that fit what we were observing, which was the ability of this enzyme when overexpressed to cause selective gains of distinct regions. And in that time, it was a 1Q12H locus or SAT2 locus. And then in collaboration with Gaddy Getz's team, we went on to demonstrate that um, there was correlations between when this gene or KDM4 was amplified, there were other regions in the genome that correlated with amplification. That allowed us to find additional sites. So tumors told us what to test for in the lab and we validated in the lab. And so that was that one part at the same, and that was through Josh and collaboration with other labs, but also Capucine. And then Capucine went on in my lab to really characterize this other role in the cytoplasm and how, what is the cytoplasmic function of chromatin factors? Um, and where we discovered a key role in translation. What's really gratifying about that is she's now continued that line of work in her own laboratory and has established novel roles for other re regulators in the context of translation. Um, and it creates a unique vulnerability actually, because they're important for the process. So if you handicap those through inhibition, um, you can actually sensitize to other quote, Uh, translation therapeutics. Um, so that's, there's these two worlds. So then my lab, because of the interest in the replication and because a clear role there, we really dug deep into understanding and uh, then publishing uh, work around the identification of not only KDM4A and amplifying uh, select targets in the human genome, but then opened it up to, you know, other, many, many other factors and other loci like EGFR, um, most recently MLL, or KMT2A, um, and so on. Yeah, um, so this is what you just mentioned. Does this uh, Was this then work on the mTOR inhibitors? Um, because you also showed that uh, SNPs and KDM4A associates with uh, increased uh, sensitivity to those inhibitors. Yeah, so um, so the role of the... In so this is... So there's the nuclear cytoplasm. I think you're raising a really good point that I think is important to emphasize is that while we may study a protein in the nucleus or other people study a protein in the nucleus, 
we need to remember that they can transverse between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. It's many of these epigenetic chromatin regulators go between both compartments. We may or may not pay attention to that depending on what the lab's focus is, but it's important to realize that they can have a life in the cytoplasm and that life there could be very important. And so how we began to understand that part for the cytoplasm was because I was also very interested in polymorphisms of epigenetic regulators, and I still am. We have studies that are ongoing for this now, and we collaborate with other labs here at Fox Chase on this too. And what we realized is there was a coding variant in the demethylase, and that coding variant was able to change its protein turnover rates. And that was very striking to us when CAP found that because it was meant there was a differential turnover rate. If there's differential turnover rate, under certain conditions, could this create an Achilles heel or create some type of bad phenotype? And so we looked at that carefully and we did an unbiased drug screen against a bunch of cell lines, about a hundred of them lung cancer. And we found that there was an increased sensitivity of the ones that carried a homozygote version of the polymorphism for TOR inhibitors or protein or inhib inhibitory pathways that touch translation. And that's what made us then look very carefully at our complex. And that's when we saw this whole translation enrichment. Um, so then we went on to show it played a role in initiation and associated with various factors. So what that did is that opened our eyes to how would we may be studying the kind of role of replication in the nucleus. There was this other role that they play in the cytoplasm. And through that and understanding that, if you inhibit that plus an associated protein synthesis inhibitor or mTOR, you could synthesize the cells. So that created a way you could create a synthetic vulnerability mm -hmm. um, targeting that other role of the enzyme. Do you think that projects, scientists, um, and the science that, that is done nowadays uh, takes this into account, um, that proteins can have different roles when they are placed in different compartments? It's a really good question. I don't, I think, you know, I would say that most people, I think due to the inherent pressure of knowing what you know, um, being comfortable in one space, um, dogma kind of pushing you a certain direction. I think a lot of people will, if it's enriched in a compartment, they focus there. If it should be in gene regulation or transcription, they focus there. But I think what, And I think this would be the advice, this advice I give to people on the team is that you want to look for what they do, right? And yes, um, it may make sense to look over in that one area. So I did that when I first started. I looked at genes and was hoping for this clear gene transcription role because that's what I was comfortable with and was, you know, had been working in a lab focused in that space. But unlike, say, LSD1, the first demethylase, which is part of co repressor transcriptional complexes, it wasn't clear that that's what this thing was doing. And so I always, I kind of take, I like to take a step back and look at where things are and look at patterns and look at relationships when I look at the science we do. And I think for trainees, if they take a step back and while you want, or you may have a hypothesis, look for the thing you can't explain, because if you see something, uh, whether it be a different compartment of enrichment or something that doesn't. It surprises you or, you know, a novel link, but you can't explain it. Don't throw it away. Um, at least annotate it and make sure the lab knows, but also start to think about what could it be telling you? Because that's where some of the bigger findings come from. Yeah. So to further characterize KDM4A, um, you also looked at microRNAs. Um, and there you showed that uh, it is indeed regulated by several microRNAs. Um, so what did you do there and what kind of microRNAs did you find that regulate KDM4A? Yeah, so we, what we did is we went on to ask the question, so um, how, we, how we got to the microRNAs um, was we discovered, so uh, in those early days, we discovered that there was regulation of the protein at the, uh, through proteasomal turnover. This was a key piece to controlling its involvement and controlling S phase um, and altering it. We also realized at the same time that hypoxia was influencing the stability of the protein through this kind of mechanism. 
So this told us that the protein at the regulatory level was key. That brought our eyes to asking, were there any microRNAs that were possibly involved in controlling the enzyme? And so when we did that, we identified the micros that were in the free prime UTR. We demonstrated they controlled it. And then we found that they were able to um, impact the stability or the, the presence or how much the protein was available. And that in turn then drove these extra chromosomal focal copy gains. And what was, I think one of the cooler parts of that study, and I think this is one that it, that so going back to your question about like uh, focus or look, what we, we observed something that then we s started applying more globally. We observed that when that microRNA was deleted on chromosome 19, there was an association with copy amplifications or gains of 1Q12 and 1Q21. That was interesting to us because that suggested there was a crosstalk between the two. We looked in that more deeply. There was a, a, a pro-survival or a, a what we could call a dro uh, oncogene driving resistance that was there called CKS1B. And that was the first time that we, and I think others, would have demonstrated that a consequential alteration of one chromosome would in turn selectively alter or influence amplifications on another one. And the reason that's important is that highlights that um, things are not just randomly happening. So if you look at the genome and you see a deletion and an amplification, you might assume that there's big problems that transpired. But we, and I hypothesize, and our lab has pursued and consistently seem to be seeing this relationship, that some of these events are actually causal to one another. And you can mechanistically begin to dissect it apart and explain it. So that's from that work, that I think is one of the highlight important pieces. But it also showed a different way to control enzymes. It was, you know, microRNAs can influence it. Post-translation modifications for stability can influence it. It's not just gene regulation of the target. It's these other um, protein level alterations that become important to pay attention to. Do they need to be in close proximity to each other? Or is the microRNA mobile enough to... Do it everywhere. <laughs> um, I I mean, we didn't find anything that deviated from what people have studied as far as how microRNAs work. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be able to engage your target. You know, if the UTR length changes or something or you mutate it, it doesn't work. So, um, but otherwise, it you know, followed the same principles, at least for the study uh, that we um, did. Mm -hmm. So then you addressed the causal relationship between histone marks and the replication timing, which is uh, also a very interesting um, thing because replication timing is uh, also yeah very important for several things. So what did you do there and what did you find? Yeah, so the work that then came out years later, um, it was, I think, Cap's like last big paper from her laboratory uh, before she, while she was, she had already moved her lab to, to start her lab at Stanford is um, we demonstrated that the, um, so the 2010 paper you asked me about, the very first one, set the stage that the enzyme potentially could control replication timing. We looked only at a couple of loci. We looked at more heterochromatic regions because we thought it was through canine trimethylation alone. Then when we launched this other study, which was looking at a broad range of epigenetic marks, lysine methylation in particular, the broad marks, coupling that to replication timing, refined time points, is when our eyes opened to realize that the demethylase was, yes, <clears throat> the heterochromatic regions of K9 tri, which are a substrate, were impacted, but not the majority. It actually was a H3K36 dimethyl energetic region, uh, not an energetic inside of a gene. What I mean by energetic is large two megabase domains that are just it by itself, not containing many of the other modifications. And that was really centered in mid S phase, not early, not late, but in the middle. And that it was really influencing the mid S phase replication um, through this kind of state or modification we found. And what we found also is consistent with the idea of genes having some exclusivity for K9 or um, 36 or K27 and 36, 
we found that when we looked at the genome scale of 50,000 base pair resolution, um, looking at the genome itself, we found that these these types of modifications were states separated from each other, um, which meant that there were kind of ex, kind of this mutual exclusive boundaries established. And then what we found is the demethylase, when it perturbed those kind of modifications, 36 or 9, you almost got infiltration of other, you could change the dynamics around those modifications, which had impacts on um, replication timing. And 11% of the genome was controlled. So when we started in 2010, we had two loci. Mm -hmm. By the time we finished the study, and, uh, 20, and we published in 21, was that it was 11% of the human genome regulated. And that actually opened the door for us to ask many, many more questions about other regulators and what states are they controlling the genome and then what's happening to replication timing. Is that something that you are doing now or that you will be doing? Active. No, no, actively. It's a very active, it's a very, very active uh, aspect of my lab. Um, we have now profiled for replication timing uh, many of the families of enzymes, methylases, demethylases, um, we're working on multiple stories. Uh, my gra the graduate students in my lab typically have an arm on replication timing and have an arm on um, amplifications or rearrangement types of biology. You've got two, side, two, two types of projects uh, that are really big in the lab. And we've expanded beyond demethylases, but so, you know, looking at many aspects of how the epigenetic uh, landscape is altered. And what does that do to the timing of the genome and how the genome is replicated? So this is like active and ongoing. It's a, a big focus of ours um, now and in the future. Talking about amplifications and rearrangements, um, there was a last paper that was published last year. So this would be 2023. There you demonstrated that, uh, that the H3K9 mono and dimethylation balance at the MLL KM2A locus regulates those um, can you talk about this study and what you found? Yeah, so this this study is uh, takes the original observation about amplifications one step further in the sense that, a major step, because um, the original observation is that they were transient amplifications, transient copy canes, and they were these extra chromosomal events because they were not integrated in the chromosomes. So KDM4A based uh, regulatory control or some the other KDM4 member, like 4B that we published in cell in 2018, is that they control these transient events at these loci. When we discovered the MLL effect, what's interesting about MLL is it is a well-known extra chromosomal amplified gene, and it's also integrated and rearranged. And the rearrangement associates with poor, you know, consequence in patients. So we discovered that this locus was uh, amplified and regulated. And what was interesting is we demonstrated that if you passaged it, once you depleted or took down the target of 3B, they weren't just disappearing. They were staying, even though the protein came back up. And then after joining Fox Chase, because I moved my lab to build a new institute here, uh, when we, after I moved, we developed an inhibitor. We made, we, we got an inhibitor. Um, and we've since then made a whole a series of different molecules against it. We used an, an inhibitor that uh, we um, had made um, that has also is a version of a, one that had also been published, um, looking at inhibition of the family. And we gave cells the inhibitor, and we looked at how fast does the response happen? Do you, do you get the amplification of the locus? Um, if you do it quickly and you wash away the drug, does it stay or disappear? And that's where the kinetics became very interesting because we could control exposure. So within three hours of exposure, these gain events start to ha happen, excuse me. In 12 hours, you still see them, 24 and so on. Well, if you wash the drug off, as soon as you remove the drug, what you find is that they would disappear um, in those shorter intervals. So Zach, the lead author on it, was very curious about this. So he did experiments where he would treat, he'd add the drug, leave it on, wash it off, and then see what would happen. And we found that around consistently, if cells had gone through two, three cell divisions, they now would acquire these uh, permanent integrated events. Through other members in the team, we demonstrated that if we used various methodologies whether it be mitotic fish or digital droplet, that they would be inherited. So we had established that there was transient amplifications, transient site-specific gains events happening 
if retained long enough, this would then result in this consequential addition um, that's perpetuated. And what became very intriguing to us is that 3B is in fact on the 5Q locus, which is often deleted. So if you remember what I was saying earlier about the microRNA, when it's deleted, there was an association with the region being amplified that was KDM4 8 driven. In this case, the data was looking to be consistent. When you lost 3B, there was an association with MLL gains and rearrangements. We took, and that had been just shown in case reports and other studies, but we teamed up with a faculty that I had recruited here, uh, Dr. Hyun Lee, and she used, she looked at the TCGA data and computationally demonstrated that, in fact, that relationship held up in those, those tumor types. Zach went on to look at a series of uh, lines that had LOH events, a loss of endoxygenosity for uh, KDM3B. And in those cases, there was always residual or baseline gains in those cell types. This now established there was the correlative view that could be looked at from basic you know, uh, sequencing data, as well as cytologically in cancer cells. But then we were able to demonstrate that we could physically cause these events. Um, and so this, you know, this work was a combination of there's a lot of authors on the paper and every single one were valuable to the whole the whole storyline. Um, and along the way contributed key aspects. Um, and that's the other thing to be important to raise is, you know, no, at least in my lab, science is not done by just one person. It's done by a team. And uh, through that team effort, both in the past with Emily, Josh, Cap, all the way to the folks of today and the, everybody in between. It was that team effort that allowed us to make these discoveries. And what's really cool about this is the team keeps perpetuating the data forward and teaching the next group so that we can keep it, you know, in a very uniform fashion of discovery going ahead. Talking about going ahead, imagine you are due to submitting a grant proposal tomorrow. What would you have written into that? <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, so... It's funny you ask because there's two areas that my lab is actively pursuing, which is replication timing and epigenetics. So there's there are grants and efforts and fellowships and stuff being written in that space. And then the other part is the amplifications because my lab is very focused on building out the epigenetic network of factors controlling focal amplifications in these extra chromosomal events in the human genome. Uh, we discovered it, you know, and published that the first time in 2013. And we've been on this mission to really understand how many regions of the genome are controlled, who's regulating them, and how are they being uh, altered? And then could that open opportunities for therapeutics or biomarkers or all these? So that's really a major focus in my lab. It's my life. It's a passion of mine is to really understand that. So those are the two areas that are actively uh, being written about or being focused on. Mm. So for the last 35 minutes almost, we have been on a journey through your scientific career. Did you miss something important or would you like to add something? Yeah, it's a good one. Um, it goes to the the um, what I mentioned that I had moved my lab. So I was involved in building an epigenetic center when I was in Boston. And then word had got out that I was interested in doing this. And I had the fortunate pleasure of being recruited by John Chernoff, who's our cancer center director um, now at Fox Chase Cancer Center, to come build a Cancer Epigenetics Institute. And I'm mentioning this now because as you know, people think about career and steps, um, Sometimes once you realize that something's better for you to do and you start, you let these options come forth. And I was very fortunate because John's view and mission and goals aligned beautifully with mine. And uh, Fox Chase has just a remarkable environment, um, super supportive for trainees, super supportive for faculty, super supportive for the clinicians. And we care immensely about the patients in a very deep way. And it's a historical thing that's been going on for a long time. So they recruited me to come here and not only continue and expand my science, right? I've had wonderful collaborations here already and many more ahead, but really to come here and build something that could be a legacy or leave an impact. So we created the Cancer Epigenetics Institute that brings bench to bedside, um, meaning that we do we we don't disregard basic science because without basic science, you can't understand the mechanics. If you understand the mechanics, it can accelerate how you might target or use it. At the same time, we focus on helping bridge relationships to academia, but also industry partners or pharma partners or biotech partners. So whether it be technology companies, whether it be a, a company that has a pharmaceutical target, whether it be that. And we try to, and the goal of this institute is to help facilitate both sides and bridge between. 
<clears throat> and so we currently have, we went, the Institute was launched on March 2nd of 2021. And officially, we now have 25 faculty that are part of our institute. Two most recent hires um, that came out of MSK, um, Hanzi Lo and Wei Ren Fang. And, you know, it's just been a really remarkable experience building that because what it's done is it allows the assembly of folks across various areas of the epigenetic or chromatin world um, and studying various aspects, but creating an environment where it's a very strong team mentality. So kind of what would be happening in the lab, but on a more global scale with faculty. And then being able to also then use that same mentality to incorporate industry partners, whether it be, like I said, technologies or pharmaceutical or biotech or therapeutics, really bring them together so we can make the advancements at the discovery level, but bring it to patients so we can better impact their lives. And so that's kind of uh, the where I'm at now and what I've been doing. Um, and so not only is it this uh, institution allow for us to expand and make that impact, it allows my lab to continue the science that we're doing and enjoy doing and have trainees that are just out there, you know, making, you know, making big strides and moving on and doing things. But uh, it allows us to create this environment for interaction, uh, for support, for um you know, the, keeping our eyes on the goal, which is hopefully through discovery, we can change somebody's life in a positive way. Yeah. This seems to be a very interesting, a very hard <laughs> and a very important task at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 I would say it's been a lot of fun. I, I'll be honest because I have leadership that are very supportive. Um, and I think, you know, if someone were to say, you know, what's big one piece of advice for building something, it is that. You've got to find people who support you, who also align and, and believe in you and let you do what you're good at doing. Yeah. And, you know, that's been one of the most remarkable things at this point in my career is to have uh, the leadership at our center and in our institution be like that. And then not be afraid to give you the ability to build something with a vision. Um, there's no fear of how it's going to affect somebody. It's The whole goal is for it to impact the place in a better way. And I think that's been that's been really remarkable at this kind of point in my career too to have that exposure plus the ability to do the science I love so much. Mm. So to finish, what is your personal definition of epigenetics? Uh, a, um, so <clears throat> it is so the way I see this is it's all the events around the DNA that allow an event to cause be generated, but they can be reversed, and so. I think is the more we're learning, the more we're realizing various components can control that process. Um, so I think, you know, from our own work, uh, one of one of my dear colleagues said to me once when they saw it, they said, this is like, an, this is an epigenetic event. We knocked out the gene KDM4A in a cell and we subjected them to hypoxia. Well, they no longer could cause copy gains or amplifications. They were unable to do it. We then, you know, put back the gene at a at the gene dose level single celled them out, grew them up, and then resubjected them. And now they reinstated the ability to cause the amplifications. And so that is what I would consider an epigenetic event because it means the system can do it. There are factors that allow it, but there's ways to reverse it. So that's kind of how I view it, uh, which is kind of a, a more generalized a view of how many of the people in the field um, who are all superstars and amazing who've laid the groundwork that's kind of how i'm viewing it based mm -hmm. on everything we're doing and seeing and as we're learning about all the things that influence it so thank you john for your time and for being on the show no yeah, it was my pleasure thanks for listening to this episode of the epigenetics podcast from active motif we hope you enjoyed it you can find all the mentioned references in the show notes please rate review and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. We'd love to hear from you, so please send us your feedback on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or via email at podcast at activemotif.com, and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. For more great epigenetics content, check out the Active Motif blog at activemotif.com forward slash blog. Thanks for listening and stay tuned.